its second semester 2017. This is a revision seminar for Maths 1B, possibly the last year of this curriculum. Uh, and um, if you're watching this in the future, that means that this topic is still in <laughs> Maths 1B. So, hello. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk um, right now about orthogonal diagonalization. Which I swear is just there so that we can have a nice long word uh, of diagonalization that's difficult to say. It always makes you sound smart when you have a long word that's difficult to say. So. Uh, right, orthogonal diagonalization is a process by which you turn um, an, a nice square matrix into a diagonal matrix using an orthogonal matrix. Yeah, okay. So we have a square matrix A. becomes a diagonal matrix. And this is done with an orthogonal matrix. And it turns out, which is called P, for no good reason, um, uh, and it turns out that that square matrix actually isn't just a square matrix, it has to be a symmetric matrix. Okay, so that's the process. So uh, in order to understand that, we have three different names for types of matrices and we should really know what they all mean um, in order to understand what that picture is and we also need to know how to do it as well, um, but that's the idea. So the reason it's called diagonalization is because it produces diagonal matrices and the reason it's called orthogonal because it uses orthogonal matrices to do it. So a matrix is some, okay, so here's the thing, there are some definitions in maths that have a good, um, you know, natural geometric pictorial meaning that you can understand them, um, but the definition in maths is chosen to be written in such a way that it can be used in a proof. So symmetric is one of those things. So a symmetric matrix is a matrix that you can turn over, like flip it in its xy, in its main diagonal, and it, be, and it stays the same. So a symmetric matrix <coughs> you know, stays the same, well, it has symmetry. It's the same on either side of the main diagonal. But the actual definition is that the transpose is the same as the original. That's the definition of being symmetric. So this one is how to tell if something's symmetric by staring at it. Everything is the same on either side of the, di of the main diagonal. Right. Um, but the maths, maths symbol version is that A transpose is equal to A. So if you turn all the columns into rows, um, then you get the same thing as what you started with. So that's a symmetric matrix. An orthogonal matrix An orthogonal matrix um, is one whose transpose is equal to its inverse.
So I suppose it's possible to be both symmetric and orthogonal if the matrix is equal to its own inverse, which is fairly rare, but it's possible. Um, and an orthogonal matrix has the property that its columns are an orthonormal basis. Um, technically, you not, can't say the word basis without saying what it's a basis for. They're an orthonormal basis for whatever Rn you're in. So to be an orthonormal basis, that means that the columns all have to be orthogonal to each other um, and they all have to be length one. So interestingly, even though they, the columns are an orthonormal basis, they just call it an orthogonal matrix instead of an orthonormal matrix, which would make more sense to me. But that's just what they do and I don't know why. Um, so yeah, so that is the columns are orthogonal. to each other and they're all length one. And when I say length, I mean, you know, you square everything and add them up and then square root. That's how you do the length of a vector. Okay, so that's an orthogonal matrix. Beautiful. And a diagonal matrix. is a matrix that um, the only place it has entries that aren't zero is on the diagonal. And that is actually the definition. All the non-zero entries are on the diagonal. Um, I suppose the, the really math symbol definition would be that, you know, if D is the matrix Dij, then Dij equals zero for I not equal to J. That's the maths definition. Not that anyone ever asks you that. They just assume that you know what they mean by a diagonal matrix. So for example, There's nothing stopping you having a zero on the diagonal. You're allowed to have a zero on the diagonal. You're just not allowed to have anything other than zero off the diagonal. Cool. So there are the three kinds of matrices that are involved here. And we want to turn one of these into one of these by multiplying by one of these. That's what we want to do. OK. Cool. Why do we care? Well, I mean, in Mass 1B, the reason we care is that because we can, turn, we can figure out what shape a quadric or a conic is by doing orthogonal diagonalization. Um, but also, diagonal matrices are really cool because they're really easy. If you multiply two diagonal matrices together, you just multiply the matching entries along the diagonal, and that's the answer. If you do a diagonal matrix to the power of 7, you just do each number to the power of 7. Um, they're really very cool in terms of making it easy to do your maths. Um, so it's nice to be able to turn things into diagonal matrices. Okay, so there's two sides to this. There's the proof side where you prove that certain things can only happen if you've got, um, you prove for example that it can only be orthogonally diagonalizable. I guess that's my last terminology, I better write that down. Orthogonally diagonal diagonalizable. Orthogonally is the little known um, street in magical London um, where all the where they provide arithmancy services. <laughs> Thank you. I've been waiting to use that. <laughs> if you don't get it, come and see me later. Um, so, 
um, orthogonally diagonalizable matrix. This is how I shorten orthogonally diagonalizable. A is orthogonally diagonalizable when there is an orthogonal matrix P so that P transpose A P is D where D is diagonal. That's the definition of being orthogonally diagonalizable. It's possible to get an orthogonal matrix and do that procedure where of multiplication and produce a diagonal matrix D. Okay, so there's two sides to this. There's all this, this proofy stuff where you can prove, for example, that the only way to make an orthogonally diagonalizable matrix is for it to be um, symmetric, um, which is sort of disappointing because not very many matrices are symmetric, but that's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll cope. Um, and you can prove things like if a matrix is orthogonal, um, then its columns do have to be uh, an orthonormal basis, and those sorts of things. There's the proof sort of side to it, and then there's the actual procedure of figuring out what the matrix P has to be. And so I'll just do a quick chat about both of those things. So some things that are true, that are worth knowing, and these are theorems, I suppose. Okay, A is orthogonally diagonalizable if and only if A is symmetric. I don't even know what number these theorems are in your book, it really doesn't matter. If they don't have a person's name attached to them, you don't have to remember what they're called. You just have to remember what they are. So, the only way it can be orthogonally diagonalizable is if it's symmetric, and if it's symmetric, then it's orthogonally diagonalizable. P is orthogonal if and only if its columns are an orthonormal basis or whatever space they're in. Okay, what else have we got that's true? Ah, um, if P transpose A, P is D. Now, you're supposed to, if you say these theorems properly, you're supposed to say what all the letters stand for, but I'm, I'm going to assu assume that I've already said that P is a matrix, uh, P is an orthogonal matrix and A is a and A matrix and D is a diagonal matrix. If that is true, oh, just a second, this happens if and only if, yeah. sorry. So P inverse AP, regardless of the T, happens if and only if the columns of P are eigenvectors of A. So it's only possible to create P inverse AP um, if the columns of P are eigenvectors, and if you want um, P transpose AP to do that as well, <coughs> it'll be true as well, um, you know, including when P transpose is the same as P inverse. Okay? I think that's it. Anything else that's true? Uh, no, that's about it. Cool. So these are the three major truths, I think. If someone's busy looking through their lecture notes, feel free to tell me one. I'm going to leave a space just in case I've missed one. Okay. So what this tells me um, is that I can now find a process for creating 
I am going to put another truth in there. I can now create a process for finding this matrix P. So P inverse AP equals D only happens if um, P is made of eigenvectors of A. So I'm going to need to find the eigenvectors of A if I want to find the matrix P. And P can only be orthogonal if they're an orthonormal basis, of I basis, and so I need an orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. So I'm going to need to find the eigenvectors and then turn them into an orthonormal basis. And then I will have found the matrix P. And the fact that it's symmetric means it's not even worth trying unless it's a symmetric matrix to begin with. But I do need one more truth that is from Maths 1A that is a useful thing to know, and that is that eigenvectors that go to an eigenvectors are independent. Ah, oh, even better. Okay. If A is symmetric, eigenvectors for different eigenvalues aren't just independent, they're orthogonal. Right, I knew there was another one. I just couldn't remember what it was. Okay. So if A isn't a symmetric matrix, you know the eigenvalues for different eigenvectors are independent, but if it's symmetric, they're not just independent, they're orthogonal, which is better. So that's good. That tells me a lot of useful information. So because of this, this tells me a process. So here's my process. So, you know, and I need, step zero is that I need, you know, A to be symmetric. If it's not symmetric, give up. Don't do this because it won't work. You can diagonalize it and you can do normal diagonalizing, but you can't do orthogonal diagonalizing if it's not symmetric. So you need A to be symmetric, okay? That's sort of step zero. Step one is that you need to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A. Right. And then you need to pick um, enough eigenvectors for each eigenvalue. Yep. And the way to do that is actually not just to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of A, but find a basis for each eigenspace. So that eigenspace is, when you do find the eigenvectors, you're going to get like an S times something plus a T times something, and you just, you need a basis. You need to take those vectors and next to that, but I'll do an example in a second. So we need a basis for each eigenspace, and the reason we do that is because we know that, like, you could, if you wanted to, find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors of A, and then get a list of eigenvectors, which, which is a basis, and then turn that into an orthonormal basis, but you don't need to worry so hard about it because you know that each, they'll come in blobs that are, in, are orthogonal to each other and so because of this truth just here. And so that means that I only need to um, turn each eigenspace separately into orthonormal basis. Orthonormal basis for each E space. And then you can just list them all next to each other and that gives you your columns of P. Columns of P and then the matching eigenvectors. Uh, make the diagonal of D. Okay, that's my process. Good-o. It seems long, and that's only because it is. 
Um, but it's a little shorter than just finding an orthonormal basis all in one go. All right. So in this course, um, you're not asked to find, to orthogonally diagonalize any matrix bigger than 3 by 3 in Maths 1B at the moment um, because you use it to create quadrics which are in three dimensions. Um, yes. We're not going to make you do quadrics in four dimensions even though they are way more fun. Um, but with that extra fun comes a bit of extra responsibility of having to diagonalize four by four matrices so it's just too much work. So here's my process. So let's do an example. Actually do one that's actually going to work. Right. Should have gone simpler. Right, I know for a start just by looking at this matrix that one of its eigenvalues is 5 because all the rows add up to 5. So if all the rows add up to the same number, that has to be one of the eigenvalues. Sorry? Yeah. So I know that for, for a start. So, so that at least I know when I'm looking at this that I should be getting a lambda minus 5 somewhere. And maybe when I do the recording, I'll go back and remove the crappy bit. Or maybe I won't and just show that it's okay to be wrong sometimes. As long as by the end of your exam you're not wrong anymore. Okay. This one I reckon some raw operations will in fact help. I'm just going to make some zeros. So my row 3 is going to be row 3 minus row 2. So minus 2, we've got a minus lambda, and minus 2 minus minus 1 is plus 1. And this minus lambda minus 1, minus minus 2, Right, there we go. It's looking good. So I made a zero here just so that I had some extra zeros in place um, to help me out. I could make some more zeros in a minute, but I have noticed that I have, just a second, that's a minus one just here. Minus two, minus, minus, yep. Yeah. Okay. So I have noticed that this is a minus lambda minus one, which is minus of lambda plus one. So both of these have a lambda plus 1, and 0 has got a lambda plus 1 in it too because it's just 0 times lambda plus 1. So they all have a lambda plus 1. I can factorize that out of that row. Classic thing that you were taught in Maths 1A but didn't realize. So, and look. Part of my, my um, characteristic polynomial has already been factorized for me. I've got a lambda plus 1 times other stuff. So I know that one of the eigenvalues is minus 1. So I might just... What was that? Yes. Thank you. Yes, because this is minus lambda plus 1. Good. Good move. Um, I think I'm just going to add a couple on here to get a column with lots of zeros in it. Or I could add it on here. Whatever. Very one plus. Two of row three and row. 2 is row 2 plus 2 of row 3, just to clear some zeros in there. So we add on 2 of them, we'll get minus 4. Add on 2 of them, we'll get a 0. 
Add on two of them, we'll get a lambda plus one. Add on two of them, we'll get a zero. Cool. So now I can do this, and I reckon I can do it from there. Because technically I'm expanding down this column. It's minus plus zero, minus zero, plus one times this determinant. There we go. Now my magic tricks work. Who would have th thought that magicians had to set things up in beforehand to in order for their magic tricks to work? So lambda minus one times lambda plus one is lambda squared minus one. And minus four times minus two would be plus eight, but I have to take that off. Lambda plus one, lambda squared minus nine, and I can factorize that. And five wasn't an answer. Have I done something wrong? Hmm. Yeah, that's puzzling. Hmm. All right, well, we'll see what happens. I'm, I'm, I don't like it, but that's okay. I'm really not doing well today. I apologize, and I'll probably apologize multiple times. So when lambda equals minus one, I get um, minus one, minus one. Sorry, I really should say lambda equals minus one, minus three, and three. No, I don't believe it. It has to be five, because this they all add to five. So I have done something wrong. So I need to find it. Where'd that go wrong? Row three minus row two. We had a minus lambda and a minus minus one, which gave us minus one. That's still good. They've all got a lambda plus one and I've left with a minus one here. Aha. I didn't do anything to this stuff when I added things on, did I? I add on two of those, that's going to be a lambda minus three. Lambda minus one plus two, that's right. Huh. Well, it makes sense again. It's going to make the rest of my maths a little harder to figure out. What's that? Lambda minus three. So I get lambda minus one, lambda minus three, still minus eight. And I get lambda squared minus three lambda minus lambda plus three. Right, here we go. Lambda squared minus four lambda minus five. And I just need to think of two things that multiply to give minus five and add to give minus four, which would be uh, minus one and, no, minus five and plus one. Right. And the world makes sense again. Lambda equals minus one and minus one and five. <sighs> See, wasn't it good that I knew in advance that five was one of the eigenvalues because then I knew I was wrong when I got to this point. Uh, and something about the psychology of how people make up um, these questions is that they'll often, because it's easy for someone to make up a matrix which has an eigenvalue of five by making sure the rows add to five, you're likely for that sort of thing to happen because that's how people write exam. If they're very clever, they'll get, well, they'll get a Wolfram Alpha or something to calculate something fancier, but whatever. Okay, I reckon I can guess the eigenvalues for minus one, actually. If I did this column minus that column, I get one minus one zero, which is what I would put to get that column minus that column, so I expect an eigenvector of one minus one. So I reckon I can guess what all the eigenvectors are without even doing the rest, but I'll do it properly. If lambda equals minus one, it's there twice. So because it's a symmetric matrix, I'm guaranteed to get 
two dimensions worth of eigenvectors. With a non-symmetric matrix, you're not guaranteed, but with a symmetric matrix, you are. And so I'll go back to here, and I'll put my lambda equals minus 1 in. Er, there. So I have minus 1, minus 1, which is minus 2. And what I'm trying to do is solve for the x, y, z that when I multiply by that matrix, it gives me 0. And, well, I can, though most of those rows are the same, so I can do row operations that would create zero rows, like row 2 minus row 1 and row 3 minus row 1, and I can divide everything by minus 2, and so I can do this. And here in Mass 1B, there's no reason to tell the person what all the row operations were. Just go for it. <laughs> you probably want to say, you know, some row operations. <laughs> but I know what they are. I know I can make them. I just had to think it through. And this is in reduced row echelon form. I've got a pivot here, and I can stick some free variables in there. So let's call this one S, and this one T, and then the X is going to be... So X plus Y plus Z is 0, so that's going to be minus S minus T. So X, Y, Z is minus s minus t s t which is s lots of minus one one zero told you plus t times minus one zero one okay that's nice so i found the eigenvector for that and then the next eigenvector would go with lambda equals five So where was my matrix again? So when lambda equals 5, I've got 5 minus 1, which is 4. Okay, this one's not so easy, but I can divide everything by 2. Now, I know I'm guaranteed to get a free variable here. Actually, I know I'm guaranteed to get exactly one free variable because the, the um, eigenvalue was there once in the list because um, the, the other one was there twice. So I actually know I'm guaranteed to be able to make a row of zeros. I could just pretend that I've done everything right. But I'm just going to check. Um, the other one I could do because they're all the same row, so that was a little easier. So we are going to have to go... How are we going to do this? I suppose you traditionally put ones at the front, don't you? So let's put that row at the top and times it by minus one. Okay, so I just switched those two. And then I can add this onto there. That's looking promising. And I can take two of this off of there. So this minus two of that is zero. This minus two of that is minus three. This minus two of that would be minus one plus four, which is three. And excellent. My second two rows are um, multiples of each other. And they're both multiples of three. So I can do this. So I did that. If I was being careful about my row operations, I would have written them in, but sorry, guys. Um, and then I need one more to finish that off. Which was... This minus that, which would be... Right. Yes? Oh, right. I think I'm done. So there's my pivots. I've got a free variable there. Let z be equal to t. Then x is also t. y is also t. x, y, z 
is t, 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 which is t lots of 1, 1, 1. And 1, 1, 1 is what you would multiply to add up the rows. And so that's good. I should just check to make sure my eigenvectors really are eigenvectors before I do anything else. So 1, 1, 1 gives me 5. 1, 1, 2 plus 1 plus 2 is 5. 2 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1 is 5. Yes, that's good. That was a correct eigenvector. Minus 1 plus 2 is 1. Minus 2 plus 1 is minus 1. Minus 2 plus 2 is 0. So I get 1 minus 1, 0, which is minus 1 times this. So that's working. Okay, excellent. Haven't done anything wrong yet. Well, not since the last time I did something wrong anyway. Um, okay. So I just need some bases for those eigenspaces. So let's do E minus 1, which already had a basis so far of, what was it? Minus 1, 1, 0 and minus 1, 0, 1. Okay. Now because there's two of them, I'm going to have to do the Gram-Schmidt process on them. So I'm going to have to... Um, Project, subtract, normalize, well, normalize and then project, subtract, normalize. So, can I give these names u1 and u2? The length of u1 is square root of minus 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 0, which is root 2. And so, therefore, my first one is normalized. Okay. And then the second step is to project this onto there. So I'm going to need to know what u2.v1 is. Now the 1 on root 2 is still going to be there. And then minus 1 times minus 1 is 1. That's it. Okay, that's 1 on root 2. And then u2 dot v1 times v1 is 1 on root 2 times 1 on root 2 and 0, which is a half of minus 1, 1, 0, which is minus a half plus a half, 0. And then my v2 dashed will be my old u2 minus this thing. So my old u2 was minus 1, 0, 1. And I have to take this off. So minus 1, minus, minus a half would be minus 1 plus a half, which is negative a half. Excellent. But I don't care about that particular vector. I just want the direction. So this is the same as if I had just used minus... It times everything by minus 2. 1, 1, minus 2. I'm just going to check if that's still an eigenvector, just in case I've done everything wrong. It should still be an eigenvector. One plus 1 plus 2 is 3. And then minus 4 is negative 1. 2 plus 1 is 3. And then minus 4 is negative 1. 2 plus 2 minus 2 is plus 2. So everything's minus 1 what it was before. Excellent. It really is an eigenvector. Haven't done anything wrong there since before. Okay. And so therefore my V2, I need the length of this. 1 squared plus 1 squared plus minus 2 squared. So 1 plus 1 plus 4 is root 6. And so I've got my V2 is 1 on root 6 times 1, 1 minus 2. All 
All right. And then I need an orthonormal basis for the other eigenspace. E5, well it had a basis of just, what was it, 1, 1, 1? So since there's only one vector, I just have to do the normalized step instead of the project subtract normalized. So, so the length is is root 3, so therefore I'll use my basis of 1 on root 3, 1, 1, 1. Okay. So let's see, my matrix P is going to be made out of the vectors that I just made. My first basis vector for minus 1 was this. My second basis vector for minus 1 is this. And my third basis vector which goes with 5 is this. That's my P. And I know as long as I've done everything correctly, and everything seems to be correct so far, that um, P transpose A, P should come out to the matching eigenvalues on the diagonal. Yay! Good. That was a good one to, f to, to find online, that question, um, because it required me to do um, orthogonal um, orthonormal basis for one of the eigenspaces, which is a really useful thing to have shown you. Okay, and that's the process of doing orthogonal diagonalization. There is no, not time in an exam to check that P transpose AP will come out to this, but I did check along the way that everything really was an eigenvector, and as long as I've done that, it should be okay. The only other check I could have done that might have been checking to make sure my work was doing right is that these two supposedly orthonormal eigenvectors are supposed to be orthogonal to each other. So if I just dot them, yes, I do get zero. So everything's working the way it should. So checking that things are really orthogonal when they're supposed to and checking that they're really eigenvectors when they're supposed to be is a good way of checking your work as you go along. All right. The only other thing I might talk about would be proving stuff on this front. And the classic proofs are the ones that go with these truths, right? Proving that it's orthogonal, uh, that it's diagonalizable if and only if it's symmetric. Um, that's hard to do both directions, but one direction is one of the ones that you uh, get asked to do every so often. So, so I'm just laughing at myself for saying one direction. My daughter's reading a series of books called Ever After High, which is set in the, the land where the fairy tale characters' children go to high school. Um, and they have a band called One Reflection, which is funny. <laughs> Um, it's very funny actually, but they don't learn calculus or linear algebra. They learn, well the princesses learn music so that they can sing um, power ballads. Uh, anyway, you can tell I'm getting to the end of like an hour and a half of talking and I'm, I'm losing my mind. Uh, so just some of the proofs that are worth just talking through. I have a whole seminar online specifically about proofs in, in algebra, um, talking through how to, not that there's any particular rules, but just talking through how I sort of set them up so that it's easier to figure out what to do. Um, but one of the examples is, for example, prove that if A is orthogonally diagonalizable, 
then A is symmetric. Okay, so that's a classic thing that you might ask to be proved. It's been in at least one past exam. Um, and what I have to do is I have to use the algebra definition of everything. So don't think, oh, symmetric means that this thing matches that thing there. All right? Think A transpose equals A. Okay, you want to use the, the simple formula, like symbol version of things, the simplest one of those you can. So if I wanted to prove this, it says that if it's orthogonally diagonalizable, then I can prove it's symmetric. So that means my proof has to start like this. Suppose it's orthogonally diagonalizable. And then somewhere down the road, I have to say, therefore, A is symmetric. That's what my proof is going to look like, except with stuff in the middle. Okay, at least I know what I'm aiming for. And to be orthogonally diagonalizable, well, I know what that means. That means that there is a P that's orthogonal such that P transpose AP is diagonal. So there is a P which is orthogonal, so P inverse is equal to P transpose. such that P transpose AP is a diagonal matrix. And being symmetric, so I'm just going to flip back and forth between the beginning and the end, being symmetric means that A transpose has to be equal to A. So I'll get some working and I'll say, therefore A transpose equals A, therefore A is symmetric. That's what my goal is. So this tells me what to do. I need to show the person reading this that when I calculate A transpose, it comes to the same answer as A. So what I'll do is I'll go A transpose equals. And then do some equals, 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 and it should be equal to A at the bottom. All right. Well, well I haven't got anything I can do except... I suppose I could rearrange this and sub in to, to replace A with something else. That might work. I could do that. So just give me some... Sp so from here, I know that when I do P... I get that. But P inverse is the same as P transpose, so they cancel each other out. And I can put P transpose here but P inverse is the same as P transpose, so they cancel each other out and I get this. So that means that A transpose must be P, D, P transpose, transpose. And my goal is to show that this is the same as A. I don't know, but anyway. I know how to expand out a transpose at in, at over a multiplication. I have to do the things backwards and then do the transpose on each one. So P transpose transpose is just P again. Okay. But D is a diagonal matrix, which means all the things off the, di off the diagonal are zero, and so the top is the same as the bottom, and therefore it's symmetric too. No, just, I just copied what I just did. Since diagonal matrices is symmetric. And, oh look, PDP transpose is what A was. Yay! Just a second, I ran out of space. Equals A. No, that looks crap. Of course, in an exam, they won't care too much about your spacing. Equals A, therefore, A transpose equals A. Right. Phew. So you see why having A symmetric, meaning A transpose equals A, is more useful for this kind of proof 
than any other version of what symmetric means. Um, I could do other proofs. I don't know how to do most of them off the top of my head, which is probably better for you. Um, has anyone ever seen any proofs in this context that they're not sure how to do? Not sure. We're going to look at that tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Uh, the only one I know that doesn't use the algebra quite as well is the one that goes that um, if a symmetric orthogonal matrix has to have um, its columns have to be an orthogonal, an orthonormal basis. So if P is an orthogonal matrix, show that the columns of P are an orthonormal basis for Rn, I suppose. Now it's not good enough to do it for R3 even though you know that you're only ever going to be asked to do something for R3 because theoretically if you were doing statistics you might need to do this for more things um, or some other version, some other methods other than conics. So you have to do it for Rn. Um, and my first instinct is that if I have to talk about the columns of P, I should give them names. Then I can talk about them. So I have to show that they're an orthonormal basis, so I need to show so somewhere in here, I have to show that they are orthogonal to each other. And I have to show that um, they're length one as well. So I need, uh, I suppose you have to show that their dot products are zero. That's the maths fancy way of saying that they're all orthogonal to each other. And the length of PI is one. I oh, use a double line for length for vectors, don't you? Right. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, the only thing I know about an orthogonal matrix is that its inverse is the same as its transpose. So, P inverse is the same as P inverse. Okay. Well, somehow I have to dot the columns with each other. Dot products come from doing, you can do, when you do matrix multiplication, you do dot products. So I need to do a matrix multiplication that multiplies the different columns with each other. So this would be better if I wrote it as a matrix multiplication. So if I turn both sides by P, I'll get that, and that's good, I like this. Okay. Yeah. So when I do this, this is like the rows, I'm going to have to draw a picture that's not going to end up in my proof. So this is like the rows of P, the P transpose, and this is like the columns of P. And when I do this matrix multiplication, I'll do this row dot with that column and it'll produce this entry here. And then I'll go this row dot with that column and that'll produce this entry here. And this row dot with that, okay. So when I do this matrix multiplication, it's going to dot each of the rows of P transpose with each of the columns of P. But the rows of P transpose are just the columns of P anyway, because that's how transposes work. We've got it. Okay, so the ij entry of P transpose P is the row i of P 
dot with column J of P, of, sorry, of P transpose with column J of P, which is column I of P dot with column J of P, but that's just P I dot P J. But the IJ entry of P transpose P is the IJ entry of the identity because they're the same matrix. IJ entry of I. But the IJ entry of I is 1 if you're on the diagonal when I is equal to J and 0 if you're not when I is not equal to J. So that's awesome. So that's equal to 1 if I is equal to J and 0 if i is not equal to j. So there we've got it. So therefore pi dot pi is 1, but pi dot pi is just the same as the length of pi squared, and so the length of pi must be 1, and pi dot pj is 0 for i not equal to j. So P1 up to Pn are an orthonormal basis. Done. So that one was a bit different. I had no choice but to talk about the individual entries of a matrix because that's the only information I had. Yep. Yep. Oh. That one's equal because it's one on the diagonal where like it's like position one one and position one two and position one three so that yes they're equal. Good noticing, thank you. I'm very proud of you for, for telling me. It's the worst thing when someone saddles up to you afterwards and says, hey you did something wrong there. I said, but now nobody knows. All right, well, there you go. Wow, that was, wow. You know, even minus the horrible flailing that I did to begin with, um, it's still pretty good, I think. Okay, check out the thing on proofs in algebra. There might, there might be a couple more of that vein. Okay. What else was I supposed to talk about? Conics. Mm limits. Well, maybe I'll just do, since limits is written so big, I will talk about limits. But maybe what I'll do is take some requests. So I'm not going to, um, so, I'm not going to talk through all the generalities and the overview and that sort of thing because there's already a seminar with that in it. But I'll do some examples for you and talk through some of the details in them. So when people asked about this big capital letters limits, I don't know if the people who asked about that are still here. But yeah. Um, you've got one-sided and two infinity in the squeeze theorem. Do you have any particular examples that seemed a bit difficult to do? I can make up some. All right. So just so you know, um, there's a system just like with um, techniques of integration back in Maths 1A where I have a list of things that are easier than other things and so I'll try the easy ones first. Um, I do have a list of um, things that I try and um, it's based on knowing that there are only a few limits where you know the answer. So your goal is to Basically, it's all based on this idea. Look for this or this. And if it is zero or the zero, change it so it's not anymore. <laughs> 
this is basically my total advice for, um, for doing limits. And if none of that works, then use a special thing like the squeeze theorem. Cool. Because the, the, base, the idea is that not zero over zero means the limit doesn't exist. And zero over zero means that the limit could be anything and we don't know whether it exists or not and if it does what the answer is. And so you have to change it so it's not zero over zero anymore. Okay, sweet. And when there's infinity involved, with infinity, you know that not infinity over infinity um, is zero. That's what you know. So if you can turn it into that, then you'll know what to do. And if all else fails, do the squeeze. Um, uh, except look for a sine x over x. That's always a good one. <laughs> that, anyway, I'll do, this is my major advice. So I haven't gonna do this in no particular order, I'm just gonna think of them off the top of my head. If you're looking at some practice questions or whatever that you're not sure what to do while I'm talking, that's fine, just tell me some questions as I go along. I'd love it if someone had a question uh, as I got up to it. Um, nope. this one. So I'm going to do the limit as x goes to infinity of that, which is on the top x squared plus 3x minus 5, and on the bottom 2x plus 8 cubed. Actually, no, not cubed, just squared. I might ask some what ifs in a minute. Okay. So the only, at the moment I'll just see what happens. Um, when x goes to infinity, so does x squared, and so the top is going to infinity. Uh, when x goes to infinity, so does x, and then x plus 8 to x plus 8 squared, so it's infinity over infinity. That's not going to help. I need not infinity over infinity, if I can get it. All right, so I need to somehow arrange this to be something that um, I know what to do with. So. <clears throat> I know that if I see like a, just a 1 over x, that's like a not infinity over infinity. So what I need is there to be an x on the bottom and a number on the top. That's what I'm hoping for. So being a fraction, and since x is, a, is not 0 because it's a big, big number, it's not infinity either. It might be like 10 billion. Uh, or maybe next time you can get it, make it even bigger and make it 50 billion. But you can divide by x on the top and the bottom. Okay. And I can divide by x squared too. And what they're dividing by x squared will do is it will make sure that everything has sort of a constant on the top and uh, something on the bottom. And I'll deal with this in a second. So x squared divided by x squared is 1. 3x divided by x squared is 3 over x. Minus 5 divided by x squared is minus 5 on x squared. And there's a square in both of these, so I can do this. I can bring the x squared that I divided inside the square.
And now every part of that is not zero divide, not infinity divided by infinity. And so I know that not infinity divided by infinity, the limit is zero. And I know that I can that the limits can be brought in over plus and minus and times and divide and powers. So I can just go one plus zero minus zero over two plus zero squared, which is one quarter. Yay. Let's do a what if. Exactly the same question. This is good practice when you're trying to, to study. What if it had been a cubed down there? So first, my first question is, if there had been a cube, what do you reckon the answer would have been for the limit? And why? So just for, so everyone can hear that, the bottom polynomial has got a higher degree than the top polynomial, which tends to make limits at infinity zero. So um, it's not a good enough answer. If you ran out of time, you'd put it on the exam anyway, and you might get a mark for it if it made the difference between like passing and failing. So don't forget that sort of principle. Um, so you, um, what you need to do in order to make this thing, this trick that I did work is divide by the biggest power of x that is there. But you sort of divide by the big, biggest power of x that's there taking into account what would happen if you expanded it out. So if I expanded this out, there would be an x cubed. So I'm going to divide by x cubed. and the cube is going to come inside the function there. So I'm going to get x squared divided by x cubed, which is 1 over x. This is going to be 3 on x squared, 5 on x cubed. And this is, the x cubed is going to come inside, so I'm going to get 2 plus 8 on x cubed. And now I get each part of it is not infinity divided by infinity, and then when I do the whole thing, I don't have a zero on the bottom. Nope, don't need a limit anymore. Zero plus zero minus zero over two plus zero squared, which is zero. Classic. What would have happened if this wasn't squared but was just power of one. What would happen then? Well, what would the answer have been at the end? Sorry? Yeah, it tends to infinity, which tec the technical name for that is the limit doesn't exist. Um, and the reason is why? Yeah, the top is faster than the bottom. So there you go. And if they're equally spaced, like once they're both x squared, then you're likely to get just a number. Uh, so at least you expect what you know to happen. So if I was going to prove um, that this limit doesn't exist, I would divide by the biggest power of x that I see, which is x squared. Sorry, I really should have done the intermediate step so that the people reading this without watching it know what happened. I'm 
And so I get one. And now the limit of the numerator is not zero and the limit of the denominator is zero and therefore the limit doesn't exist. That was one of our classic things here, not zero over zero. But if you want to do it completely formally with, you know, with the proper working, you'll say the limit as x goes to infinity of the top is one which isn't zero and the limit of the bottom is zero, so therefore the limit does not exist. That's the formal working that you're supposed to do. I think some people accept you to say, you know, equals in inverted commas one over zero, but you're not allowed to ever say equals one over zero because one over zero isn't a thing. Well, it's a thing you can write, but it's not a thing that, it, that is a number, so nothing can be equal to it. Well, a number can't be equal to it. So they're my classic limits at infinity. They tend to be polynomials. They don't have to be, though. Let's do this one. Sine 2x over x. Good one. Yeah? Sure. I'll do that one next. This one won't take long. Okay, sine 2x over x. So I would know what to do if x was going to 0 because it's nearly sine x over x and so I would expect it to do whatever it does and I might even do that one as well. When it's going to infinity, the bottom's going to infinity and the top is not going to infinity. The top is just wiggling back and forth between plus and minus 1. So I expect that the answer will be 0 because it's got something that's not infinity divided by infinity is 0. But all my other examples where it wasn't infinity were just constant, so I can't do that. So I'm going to have to find a different way of dealing with this because I only really know how to do it when it's number divided by infinity. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that sine x, sine 2x is between two things and both of those go to zero. Sine 2x is always between plus and minus 1, regardless of what x is. Fabulous. And therefore, uh, sine, crap, that's not helpful. Yes, it is. Okay. Um, and sine 2x over x is between 1 on x and minus 1 on x. I just divided everything by x. Now, I didn't have to change which direction these inequality signs faced because x is positive because it's going towards infinity. It's a really huge positive number. Just be careful it was going to minus infinity. When you divide it by it, you would have to switch the inequality signs because when you divide by a negative, you have to switch them. And so I know that the limit as x goes to infinity of minus 1 over x is 0 because it's 1 over infinity. And the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x is 0. And so therefore, the limit as x goes to infinity of the thing in the middle is also zero by the squeeze. So if you want to use the squeeze law, you have to set up something like this. You have to state that the things on the outside go to the same answer, and then you have to say, therefore, this is the answer. Because those three things need to happen in order to use the squeeze law. And the only reason I thought to use the squeeze law is because my sign is trapped between two things already. Classic squeeze law sign that, there's, that there is a trigonometric 
there is a sine or a cos in there. Okay. So let's look at this one from this exam. Just one more minute, okay? Just, I just want to do this one because I'm, I'm into a what if. What if it wasn't x goes to infinity but was x goes to zero? Yeah, the answer is two. Oh, L'Hopital's rule is such a cop-out. <laughs> yeah! Okay, so if it was just sine x over x, I'd be good. And as long as it's sine thing over thing and both of those things are the same thing and they're both going to zero, it'll also be correct. So I'll add a 2 at the top and the bottom, and now I have sine thing over thing. And someone's saying hospital, and that's true. When you see a circumflex accent on an O, it means there's a missing S. Okay. Um, this is classic. You've got to be careful with L'Hopital's rule because technically there's some technicalities where you're not allowed to use it. So you're not allowed to use L'Hopital's rule to prove that sine x over x's limit is 1 because you can't do the deriv derivative of sine without knowing that limit already. Okay, so the example that I've been brought down is the limit as x goes to 0 of e to the power of 2x minus e to the power of minus x over x. Sweet. Well, my first check is to see if I can just sub it in. Because you know, if I could just sub it in and know there's no problems, that'll just be the answer. So e to the power of 0 is 1. e to the power of minus 0 is 1. So the top is 1 minus 1, which is 0. And the bottom is 0. Oh, 0 over 0. OK, I do have to do work. But if this had been like an x plus 1, I would have been fine. I could just sub it in and that would be the answer. All right. Well, I could use L'Hopital's rule, I suppose. Just checking to see if the exam writer didn't say, don't use L'Hopital's rule. Because that's always an indication that you're not allowed to use L'Hopital's rule. No, OK. OK. So. That's a classic, um, and it doesn't match any of the other ones that I know the answer to already. So e to the um, e to the x over x, no idea. I mean, I actually know that the answer is infinity; it doesn't exist. But um, the only reason I know that is because x, e to the power of x grows much faster than x does. And just a second, if you're talking about the speed at which things grow, that's exactly what derivatives are. So sounds like L'Hopital's rule is the go. Now I'm only allowed to use L'Hopital's rule if the limit of the top and the limit of the bottom are both zero, so I need to say that. So yeah, that's good. So we'll use L'Hopital's rule. So I have to differentiate the top. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x, but it's not an x, it's a 2x, so there'll be a 2 there. The derivative of e to the minus x is e to the minus x, but I'll, there's a minus 1 there, so I'll have to times by minus 1 divided by 1. Okay. So that's the limit as x goes to 0 of 2e to the 2x plus e to the minus x. And I can just sub it in. 2 times e to the 0 plus e to the 0 is 2 times 1 plus 1, which is 3. Be extremely careful 
You are not allowed to say this without the limits. This thing is not the same as this thing. They're only the same if they've got limits. They're completely different things, they just have the same limit. So just don't ever write that. A little bit like you should never write, you know, x squared equals 2x when you're doing derivatives because x squared isn't 2x. The derivative of x squared is 2x. So, if you're going to use L'Hopital's rule, you must tell the person reading it why you're allowed to use L'Hopital's rule by separately calculating the numerator and the denominator. Cool. Do you want me to do the other one? <laughs> okay. Any other limits that people are want to ask about? Oh, it says one-sided limits. I could do that. Right, here we go. f of x is x squared when x is less than or equal to 1, 2x minus 1 when x is more than 1. Discuss the continuity of f. Doesn't sound like it's a limit thing, but, but it is. Okay, so when it says discuss the continuity, they mean tell me where it's continuous and where it's not, and what kind of discontinuity it is if it's discontinuous somewhere. All right, so let's see. F is continuous when X is less than one, since um, there it is a polynomial. Good, because it's X squared down there when X is less than one. And F is when x is greater than 1, since there it is a polynomial, because it's 2x minus 1. That's good. So the only place in doubt is the number 1 itself, where it crosses over from this formula to that formula. So we need to decide whether it's continuous at x is equal to 1. So here we are at x is equal to 1. Well, first I'm just going to do it in my head. When x is 1, this is 1, and this is 1. So they come out to the same answer, so it's continuous. But I can't just say that. I have to do it properly. So it will be continuous when its limit exists at that point and is equal to the function value at that point. So I'm going to need to find the limit of f of x as x goes to 1. That's what I'm going to need to find. And if I find that that limit doesn't exist, then it won't be continuous there. But I can't do that calculation because f has different formulas in different places. So I'm going to need to do the limit differently on either side because it has different formulas in each place. <coughs> Pardon me. So the limit as x goes to 1 from below of f of x is the limit as x goes to 1 from below of x squared 
which is 1 squared, which is 1. There's a little philosophical thing that happened there. So the li well, I'm not trying to find the limit of x squared, I'm trying to find the limit of f. And so that's why I, where I should start my working. Don't just write this. That doesn't tell the read. Imagine the reader's a, a monkey who has, is you know, mildly unintelligent but still able to do calculus. Um, they'll think you're talking about the function x squared and f is not the function x squared. It's only sometimes, so you need to say this. The limit from the, the positive side of 1 over on that side the formula is 2x minus 1. Which is 1. So since they are equal, the limit as x approaches 1 from both sides simultaneously is 1. Now let's see, the function value of 1, when x is equal to 1, that's in this zone, so that'll be 1 squared which is 1, which is the same as the limit. So f is also continuous at x is equal to 1. Done. Continuity discussed. I have covered every possible x. If you're going to do derivatives from two sides separately, that's going to be a whole other thing. That's going to be a really weird ass thing. Let me discuss the differentiability of this function just while I'm at it. Is f differentiable at x equals 1? And then I might stop. Well, I could do the same thing, right? The derivative when I'm over on in this function is 2x. And the derivative over here is 2. <laughs> so yes, it is. That's so cool. Anyway, sorry. They're the same. The derivative is the same on both sides at x equals 1. I did not mean to do that. Anyway, that was fun. Maybe I should change this to 3x minus 2, so the answer, no, I won't. So the answer comes out to different. Okay, but the only way to know if it's differentiable, that argument that I made there of calculating the two derivatives separately and then subbing them in and saying that they're the same answer is not a valid argument to show that it's differentiable. Because neither of those other derivative functions are the derivative of the original function at that point. So you have to do it at that point. So f dashed at 1 is the limit as h goes to 0 of f of 1 plus h minus f of 1 over h. You could do it as x goes to 1 of f of x minus f of 1 over x minus 1 if you prefer, but I believe this is the definition of the derivative in mass 1b. So we need to find this limit. I just might make it a little simpler first. I did just figure out that f of 1 was equal to 1, so I'll just sub that in now. Okay. So I need to figure out this limit. So f... But if h is positive then f of 1 plus h is just a little bit, the 1 plus h is just a bit more than 1, so I'm on, I'm on this side. And if h is negative, then 1 plus h is just a little bit less than 1, so I'm on this side. So this formula for what f is is different depending on the value of h. So I'm going to need to do the limit separately depending on whether h is a positive or negative. So the limit as h goes to 0 from below of f of 1 plus h minus 1 over h is the limit as h goes to 0 from below of 1 plus h 
squared minus 1 over h, which I would need to figure out. Helpfully, the 1 and the minus 1 cancel each other out, as they should. And then I can divide everything by h, and I just get 2 plus h. So the key again, I got a 0 divided by 0 there. I just need to arrange it for to not be 0 anymore. And I can divide by h because it isn't 0. And the limit as h goes to 0 from above of f of 1 plus h minus 1 over h. Well, over on that side, that's 2 of 1 plus h minus 1. Hopefully these cancel again. I get the limit as h goes to 0 of 2, which is 2. So they are equal, so therefore f dashed 1 is 2. And therefore, yes, it is differentiable. I should say, just a second, they are equal, and so the limit, the limit as h goes to 0 of f of 1 plus h minus 1 over h exists. Therefore, it's differentiable. I mean, that's what you're supposed to say. And then you say, in fact, f dash 1 is 2. Because you're not supposed to say that something's differentiable until you declare that that limit exists. So because that's the definition of being differentiable, that that limit exists. So we went to all the effort of doing the two-sided limits, and you say they're equal, and therefore that limit exists, and therefore it's differential. Yay. If my function had been 3x minus 2 instead of 2x minus 1, then I would have gotten... Let's just do a what if. I won't do the whole question. What if it had been 3x minus 2 and not 2x minus 1. So if it was 3x minus 2, it would still have been continuous because when I put 1 into 3x minus 2, it still comes out to the same, to 1. But this time, the limit as x goes to, as h goes to 0 plus of stuff would have come out to 3. And they wouldn't have been equal, and so you would have said not equal. So um, the limit as h goes to 0 of f of 1 plus h minus 1 over h does not exist. And so therefore not differentiable. Yeah. Right. Um, cool. So there's a few random things to do with limits that I thought of um, that we could have done. Does anyone have any more that they want to ask about on the limit front? All right. I'm going to stop. <laughs>